Amen. Amos chapter number 8, the part that I want to focus on is beginning there in verse number 11 where the Bible reads, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. And they shall wander from sea to sea, and from the north even to the east, they shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord, and shall not find it. And the title of the sermon tonight is A Famine of Hearing God's Word. A Famine of Hearing God's Word. Now, I believe that today in the United States of America, there's a famine of hearing God's Word. Meaning that there are a lot of people who are hungry to hear God's Word. They desire to hear God's Word and to be filled, but they can't find it. Now, there's definitely no shortage on Bibles. There's not a famine of reading God's Word. I mean, you can go to any Dollar Tree or Walmart or even a lot of gas stations and pick up a King James Bible. Usually, if they only have one kind of Bible, it's going to be a King James Version. A lot of them are 99 cents, five dollars. It's really not hard to find a Bible, but reading the Bible is one thing. Hearing God's Word is another. You see, people are starving today to hear biblical preaching. They want God's Word to be preached. They want to hear it thunder forth from the pulpits with power, being read out loud in the church as, as Brother Dominique Davis just read this chapter and as we read a chapter at every single service and just being expounded and faithfully preached and taught, there's a famine today of hearing God's Word. Now we're going to turn to Lamentations chapter 4 tonight. And we're going to spend the entire sermon in Lamentations 4. We're going to look at some other scriptures too and jump around a little bit. But Lamentations 4 is the main thing that I want to show you because Lamentations 4 is a chapter that is about physical famine. It's about people who are literally starving. They don't have any food. And this is in the aftermath of the destruction of Jerusalem that we read about in Jeremiah. And it's talking about the literal physical famine. But we can make spiritual application of this because we're talking tonight about a famine of hearing God's Word. What are the effects of a famine of God's Word? When people desire to hear the Word of God and they run to and fro to seek it, but they can't find it. What's the result of that? That's the day we're living in. The, the reason why so many in to the sermons from Faithful Word Baptist Church online, and it's kind of an internet phenomenon, just how many people tune in, it's just simply because people all over America are hungry for this kind of preaching and they have a hard time finding it in their local area. It's not that I'm anything special or that I'm a great preacher. It's just that in many ways I'm the only game in town because there's just so little preaching being done that actually preaches the whole Bible or that actually preaches hard or that's willing to preach on all subjects or, or preach on things that are unpopular or, or controversial. So it's not that I'm anything special. It's just that people want to hear some sound biblical preaching. That's it. It reminds me of my sister. She had a, a rat breeding business. And it was very, very successful. She was very good at it. And she, she started just breeding rats and, and selling rats. I don't know how she got into it, but it just, her business really took off. And she was, she was selling so many rats, and she had to keep raising the price because the demand was just so great for these really high-quality, purebred rats. And she had their, their genealogies and their pedigrees all laid out. And she lived at the time in Fort Worth, Texas. She had people driving from Louisiana that would drive from Louisiana, purchase a rat, drive home. Drive down from Oklahoma, purchase a rat, and then drive home. People would drive up from Houston to Fort Worth, pick up a rat, you know, pay $25 for a rat, and then drive five hours home. And there was one thing that one of the customers said to her, and it, it stuck with me. He said, I'm just looking for a good, clean rat. <laughs> and, you know, he was, he's frustrated. I'm just looking for a good, clean rat. Now, it sounds so simple. It sounds so easy. But there's a famine in certain areas of, I guess, finding, you know, a good, clean rat. 
you know, the ones at the pet store, they haven't been properly socialized or they, they don't have the right pedigree, you know, the, you know, and it was the, the, the or they're not the Dumbo eared albino, whatever. I don't, I don't remember all the details. You know, my, uh, my, my uh, older sister explained it to me at the time, but the reason I bring that up is just that, you know, what people are looking for today, it's not complicated. They're just looking for somebody to just get up and just preach the Bible. Right. And just not be afraid what people think, not worry about what's going to happen and if it's going to offend someone or hurt somebody. You know, just get up and just tell us what the Bible says. Just get up and just tell us what the truth is. Just preach all of it and just, that's all we're looking for. And you young men that, that, that have a desire to preach and to go in the ministry, God can use you. You don't have to be anybody special. You just have to be willing to get up and preach and preach the whole Bible and not trim the message and be instant in season and out of season. Lamentations chapter 4, we can see some of the effects of a famine but we're going to apply it to a famine of hearing God's word as opposed to being a physical famine. Look at chapter 4, verse 1. How is the gold become dim? How is the most fine gold changed? The stones of the sanctuary are poured out in the top of every street. And the first thing I want to point out is that God's word is likened unto gold in the Bible. Of course, the famous song that's based on Psalm 19 about God's words, more to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. But when there's a famine of hearing God's word, the gold becomes dim. And not only that, it says, how is the most fine gold changed? What am I talking about? Well, because people don't know the Bible, as a result of not hearing the Bible faithfully preached, that causes a couple things to happen. Number one, the memory becomes dim. You know, people's memory of what the Bible even teaches becomes dim to where now you preach things that you would expect everybody to know from the Bible, and they don't know them anymore. They don't even know the basic Bible stories, the basic truths. But not only that, it says the most fine gold is changed. And today, we have a bunch of modern so-called versions of the Bible that have changed the Word of God. You know, this right here, the King James Bible, is the most fine gold right here. This is the true Word of God right here. But now, the gold has been changed. And look, this scripture right here, it's not talking about a change for the better. When it says that the most fine gold is changed, it's a change for the worse. God's word today has been corrupted. Yep. The Bible says we are not as many which corrupt the word of God. There are many, the Bible says, who corrupt the word of God. And there are all these new corruptions coming out all the time. The NIV, the New American Standard, the New Living Translation, the ESV. They remove entire verses. They remove entire phrase. They remove the word hell. They remove the word damnation. I mean, they make all kinds of dramatic changes. And people will say, oh, well, it's easier to understand. But that's because there's a famine of hearing God's word. You haven't eaten a real meal in so long that you don't even recognize good food anymore. And that's why you think that the NIV is a legitimate substitute for the King James Bible. If there was a, a, a constant, steady stream of the King James being preached, nobody would switch to the NIV. But the reason that that switch was able to be made was because so little of the King James was being preached in so many places that it was pretty easy to switch versions. If you were reading it every day and if it were being preached every week and you were hearing a lot of it, you wouldn't just switch to something else. But because of the famine of hearing God's word, the gold has become dim and the fine gold is changed. You say, well, Pastor Anderson, it's just the new versions are so much easier to understand. Isn't that what they tell you when you go to the Christian bookstore? Oh, that King James is too hard. You need to get one that's easier to understand. Okay, well, let's, let's, I just happened to flip open the NIV just to this passage, just to see if it was easier to understand. You look down at verse 7 in the King James Bible. I'm going to read for you verse 7 in the NIV. You tell me which one's easier to understand. So verse 7 says this, Her Nazarites were purer than snow. They were whiter than milk. They were more ruddy in body than rubies. Their polishing 
was of sapphire. Got that? Okay. Let me read it for you from the NIV. You look down at your Bible. Their princes were brighter than snow and whiter than milk. Their bodies more ruddy than rubies. Their appearance like lapis lazuli. That's what it says. Look it up in the NIV. It says, their appearance, in the King James said, their appearance, or their polishing, it says actually, their polishing was of sapphire. Okay, let's go, that's, whoa, whoa. Sapphire, that's way too hard. Let's go to one that's a little easier to understand, the NIV. It says that their appearance like lapis lazuli. Now that's spelled L-A-P-I-S, L-A-Z-U-L-I, lapis lazuli. Who knows what lapis lazuli is? Anybody? I see a few children putting up their hands. Okay, I see about six people, seven people out of a few hundred people here that know what la Look, that's not easier to understand, folks. And all throughout the NIV, you'll find all kinds of difficult things. Like where the King James will say river, the NIV will say wadi. W-A-D-I, wadi. Or where the King James will use the ultra hard word, lieutenant. <laughs> the NIV will use the easy word, satrap. Who knows what a lieutenant is? Who knows what a satrap is? Very few. The same people who knew lapis lazuli. Good job. <laughs> Let's enter you in a spelling bee. No, I'm just kidding. But anyway, the point is, and look, we could go on all night. The NIV has all these crazy readings, especially in the Old Testament, especially in books like Lamentations and Job, because so few of the NIV's readers are ever going to plow through Lamentations or Job. As long as they get the Sermon on the Mount dialed in for people, what else, you know what I mean? And just Psalm 23, they know where the NIV church is going to turn to. A couple of scriptures. I'm telling you, look, the NIV today is the best-selling Bible version in America, but actually there was a Pew Research study that was done recently on the Bible reading habits of Americans, and they found that the King James is the most read Bible. The one that people are actually reading is the King James, but the NIV is the one that people are buying and carrying with them down to the fun center, known as, you know, whatever the church, and, and getting a sugar-coated soft soap sermon. You know, they're not turning to the verse on lapis lazuli. Anyway, let me get back to the passage here. So there's a famine of God's word. The stones of the sanctuary are poured out in the top of every street. It destroys God's house when there's a famine of hearing God's word. Look at verse 2. The precious sons of Zion, comparable to fine gold, how are they esteemed as earthen pitchers, the work of the hands of the potter? So when there's a famine of hearing God's word, when there's a famine, God's people, the sons of God, the precious sons of Zion, they were comparable to fine gold. They were patterned after God's word in their lives. But now they're like earthen pitchers or the work of the hands of the potter. Go to 2 Timothy 2. Keep your finger in, in Lamentations 4. We'll come back to it. Go to 2 Timothy chapter 2, where God makes a comparison between the vessels of gold and the earthen vessels. The Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 19, Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his, and let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. So, Those of us that are saved, those of us who name the name of Christ, are commanded by, excuse me, commanded by God to depart from iniquity. You know, God wants us to get the sin out of our lives. God wants us to live a clean and righteous life. Now, we don't have to live a clean life to be saved, thank God. All we have to do to be saved is just believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and we shall be saved. But after we're saved, we want to please God. If we love God, we're going to keep his commandments. And the Bible teaches that part of that is departing from iniquity, getting the sin out of our lives. And God's word helps us to get the sin out of our lives, the washing of water by the word. God's word will clean us up when we read it and hear it preached. He says, but in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth. Now the wood and the earth, remember the earthen vessel is what we talked about in Lamentations. Some to honor and some to dishonor. 
If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use and prepared unto every good work. So there are two kinds of Christians in this world, right? There are the vessels unto honor and the vessels unto dishonor. We're all part of the household of God if we're saved. If we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, we're in the family. We're God's children. But some of God's children are vessels unto honor and some are vessels unto dishonor. Some of us are golden vessels to be used by God. Others are the earthen vessels here that are known as a vessel of dishonor. Now, why do we want to be a vessel unto honor? Because the Bible says in verse 21, if a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor. And what does that mean? To be sanctified, set apart. That's what sanctified means, holy. And meet for the master's use. Meaning that we're appropriate to be used by God. We're suitable for God's use. So the vessel unto honor is the one who's not only saved, but he's ready to be used by God. He's available. And it says there that he's also prepared unto every good work. So the vessel unto honor is the one that's ready to go. He's holy. He's separated. And he's prepared unto every good work. He's meet for the master's use. That's the vessel unto honor. Go back if you would. To, and, and by the way, notice at the beginning of verse 21. If a man therefore purge himself from these, the these that we should purge ourselves from are the vessels unto dishonor. Right. You know, we, we, if we just constantly hang around with backslidden Christians, that's probably going to have a worse effect on you than even hanging around with unsaved people. I mean, we should, the Bible teaches that it's even worse to hang around with somebody who's called a brother who's a fornicator, who's called a brother who's a drunk, or who's called a brother who's an extortioner or whatever, than even the unsaved. Because at least with the unsaved, okay, maybe you can win them to Christ. But these Christians that are backslidden and their vessels under dishonor, they're not listening to the word of God, they're an earthen vessel, they're not ready to do anything for God, they're not meat for the master's use. People tend to drag you down and hold you back spiritually. Mm -hmm. If you purge yourself from these, you can be a vessel unto honor. Amen. You know, get, it, get around the, the friends that, that you want to emulate. Don't get around people that drag you down. Get around people who lift you up and, and help you to be better and, and where iron can sharpen iron. Go back to Lamentations. Lamentations chapter 4. Just keep your finger in Lamentations because that's where we're going to be the whole time. Verse 2, the precious sons of Zion, comparable to fine gold... How are they esteemed as earthen pitchers, the work of the hands of the potter? So they went downhill from being a golden vessel to an earthen vessel. Look at verse 3. Even the sea monsters draw out the breast. Now, what is a sea monster? Sea monster. What do you think? Of? Well, the greatest beasts that are in the sea are whales. Whales, in fact, are the largest animals on this planet. Whales are much larger than you think. There are whales that are literally as long as this auditorium tonight. Literally. I mean, where this would be one end of the whale, and that would be the other end of the whale. Blue whales, sperm whales, these gigantic creatures. The Bible talks about them specifically in Genesis 1. It talks about all the animals. God says the Lord created great whales. These are some of the, the most magnificent creatures that God created. And one of the interesting things is that whales are mammals. So it says here, even the sea monsters draw out the breast. They give suck to their young ones. So the Bible is marine biologically correct here. In saying that the sea monsters draw out the breast, they give suck to their young ones. The daughter of my people has become cruel like the ostriches in the wilderness. The, the editors of the NIV didn't grasp that these great sea beasts, these great sea monsters, are mammals. So they changed this to the jackals. The jackals draw out the breast. It's just the same thing. It's just a little easier to understand, folks. But it says here, the daughter of my people has become cruel like the ostriches in the wilderness. What, what's going on here is that there's such a famine that people aren't feeding their children. Because they're all starving. Because remember, this chapter is about a famine. It says in verse 4, The tongue of the sucking child cleaveth to the roof of his mouth for thirst. The young children ask bread, and no man breaketh it unto them. 
Now this is talking about a physical famine. I mean, what could be sadder? What could be more depressing, right? Can you imagine how sad it would be to see your own young children hungry and not being able to feed them? That's probably every mother's worst nightmare. To not be able to feed your child, to have to see them starving. It's horrific when people go through famine. That's what we see here. The children are begging for bread. Nobody's giving it to them. Okay, well, let's apply this spiritually. Okay, the first point that I'd like to make from that spiritually is that just as depressing it is to see a physical famine, if we could see through spiritual eyes, that's how depressing it is to see Christians across America starving where they're not getting fed. Right. They go to church week after week. They're not getting any spiritual meat. They're not getting any spiritual sustenance. Children are begging for bread and they're not getting it. Well, here's what I've noticed. Children respond very well to biblical preaching as well, to hearing God's word. When people quit our church because they can't handle the preaching or they don't desire the preaching of God's word, they desire something a little shallower, a little lighter, It's not the children that want to leave. You know what I've noticed is that usually when families begin to attend our church, the children usually love our church. And a lot of children have, have even come up to me and said to me, you know, I like this church better. You know, I really like this. I like the preaching here. And what's funny is that I'm preaching the King James Version up here. I'm turning to some difficult passages. I'm turning to Lamentations 4, Amos 8. You know, I'm turning to some rough passages in the Bible. You know, we're preaching through Jeremiah on Wednesday nights. But you know what's funny is that even just in the last few weeks, a child said, I like Faithful Word Baptist Church because I understand the preaching. I understand it. You know, children, they're, they're more pure. They haven't been as tainted by this world and as corrupted by this world. And they desire the truth. They desire God's word. They desire true biblical preaching and they enjoy it and they learn from it and they like it. It's the adults that sometimes get backslidden and corrupted and disgruntled and disillusioned and they, they, they lose that hunger for God's word they, 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 and, and they won't even get it to their children. Look at 1 Peter chapter 2 in the New Testament. Flip over to 1 Peter chapter 2. But not only children physically, because I, I was just mentioning how young children, they actually like Bible stories, they like preaching, they like to hear God's word. But not only that, spiritual babes, babes in Christ, meaning brand new believers, they also like hard preaching. They also love to hear the word of God. And they, they just eat it up, they soak it up like a sponge. Whereas... The ones who can't handle the hard preaching and don't want to hear the heavy doctrine from the Word of God are usually the backslidden Christians that have been saved for 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, and they're backslidden. It's never the young, brand new believer who just got saved last week that can't handle the preaching. It's the moss back deacon, you know, who's been in the church 30 years that just, ah, this preaching is too much, too hard, you know, too... Too much, too, too deep, too, uh, too zealous, too, you know, too fiery or whatever. Boy, the new believer, I can't even tell you how many times I've won somebody to the Lord and got them on hard preaching and they just loved it. The new believers love it. I mean, that's why, that's why, you know, like I said, and, and I, I just want to say this again because I was just in San Antonio, but when I was in Fort Worth, when I was in San Antonio, most of the people I talked to, Hey, I've been saved for six months. I've been saved for three months. I've been saved for eight months. Well, the church there in San Antonio has only been around for 11 months. So most of the people there are, you know, new believers. And, and even when I asked for a raise of hands this morning, how many have been saved for less than five years, right? Let me ask you tonight. How many of you have been saved for less than five years? Put up your hand. Look around. How many of you have been saved for less than two years? Put up your hand. Yeah, see, we've got a lot of young 
Christians in the Lord and they love preaching. They love, they want to grow. They want to get in a church like this. They are hungering and thirsting for righteousness. They shall be filled. And then we've got a bunch of Christians who've been saved for 10, 20, 30, 40 years. They, they, they've just, they've let the fire die. But the children, they crave the word of God. They're hungry for the word of God. But sadly today across America, literal physical children and babes in Christ are hungering for the word of God. And they go to church and they get one Bible verse and a lot of blah, blah, blah. They're not getting fed. They're not being filled. Look what it says in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 1. Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and evil speakings, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. Be like a newborn babe. Be like that little child who hungers and thirsts for the word of God, that wants to hear God's word. Go back, if you would, to Lamentations chapter 4, verse 5. So what have we seen so far? Quick review while you're turning there. What is the effect of the famine of hearing God's word? Well, in verse 1, we saw that the gold became dim, meaning that the memory of the true word of God started to fade in people's mind, and then the gold was changed. Because they didn't remember the old one, they got sucked into the new, inferior, messed up version, the NIV or ESV or whatever. What else did we see? We saw they destroyed God's house. What else did we see? We saw that the servants of God went from being golden vessels ready to be used by God to being earthen pitchers that weren't really good for anything, maybe to just be shattered and, and, and used for something down the road to just be redone. Then we saw that the children were starving for God's word and they weren't receiving it. Look at verse 5. The Bible says, They that did feed delicately. Now, what does it mean to feed delicately? Well, what's a delicacy? Delicacies are expensive foods. I mean, we're talking fine foods. We're talking filet mignon. We're talking lobster. We're talking caviar and escargot and, and whatever the, the fancy delicacies, the expensive, highfalutin type of foods. He said, those who did feed delicately are desolate in the streets. And watch this. They that were brought up in scarlet embrace dunghills. They embrace dunghills. And Matt, just who knows what it means to embrace something? It means to give it a hug, right? To embrace. But we often use the word embrace metaphorically when somebody hears a doctrine or a teaching or preaching If someone were to embrace that teaching, it means that they just bring it into them and they, it becomes a part of them. They accept it with gladness. They receive it. They just, they're, they're just thrilled. If I said, oh man, I preached on, you know, uh, the, 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 whatever the subject. I, I, I went to, uh, you know, San Antonio, Texas at Old Path Baptist Church and I preached a sermon take heed how you hear, and they really embraced the sermon. What does that mean? It means that they, they, they liked it, they agreed with it, they, they wanted to act on it, right? They just, they embraced it. Or if I said, hey, I shared the gospel with someone, and they embraced it. It would just show that they just unreservedly said, yes, I'll take it. This is what I believe, right? The Bible says that they that did feed delicately are desolate in the streets. They that were brought up in scarlet, meaning they're, they're, you know, they've got a silver spoon in their mouth. Now they're embracing dung hills. That's where they're getting their food. Now you'd have to be pretty hungry, but when someone's just literally starving to death, they will embrace a dung hill. Isn't that bizarre? But this is the truth. This is, Not only do we see this in the word of God in regard to a physical famine, but you know, there are other stories in the Bible that talk about people eating things like that in a bind, you know, when they were starving to death. And you know, we could go to other stories too. I grew up in Northern California. So we grew up with the story of the Donner party and, and just, you know, eating pine needles and just, you know, just starving to death. I mean, people will just start eating whatever. Well, let's apply this spiritually. Okay, people, I mean, we're talking about Christians who once 
ate spiritual filet mignon or, or spiritual lobster of listening to fire-breathing preaching, biblical preaching, good, solid Bible preaching, it, we see them today in 2017 embracing dung hills. I'm talking about dung hills like the shack. I mean, you want to talk about a dung hill. I mean, that book and that movie is a dung hill. It's total dung. And yet, don't we just see Christians by the, you know, 20 million readers just embracing that dung hill? You know, all the millions of viewers going down to the theater and watching the shack and just eating it up. Just eating it up. At a dung hill. Literally. And today there's all kinds of other garbage out there. And that's what this is referring to. When it says a dung hill, what's a dung? it's a pile of garbage. We got all kinds of people today embracing all kinds of garbage because of the fact that they don't know God's word. There's a famine of hearing God's word. God's word is not being faithfully preached, so they embrace dung hills. I mean, the things that people believe today are mind blowing. You know, born that way after all. What a dung hill! Yet it's embraced. Hollywood puts out these so called biblical movies, they're dung. Look. That Noah movie that came out a few years ago, I read up on that thing, it's total dung. Yeah. They take the story of Noah, turn it into an environmental message. The problem with man was that he was eating too much meat and destroying the environment. So Noah's this big vegetarian and his family are vegetarians. All the bad guys are the horrible meat eaters. <laughs> This is, I, I read it up. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I've had people say, yeah, I saw the movie and that's what it was. God in that story, he doesn't want to save Noah and Noah's family. He just wants to kill everybody. So according to the Hollywood movie, the whole purpose of the ark is only to save the animals. And Noah's only purpose on the ark is just to take care of the animals. And then after he takes care of the animals, he's supposed to end the lives of his family and himself. That's what, and so that's what God wants him to do in the movie. He's supposed to literally murder and then take his own life so that, it can, so that the world can just go back to the animals how it belongs. I'm not kidding. This is what the world puts out as a biblical movie because they know all the Christians will go see it. The Christians will flock to it and say, well, it's close enough. You know, hey, hey, at least it's getting us thinking about the Bible. At least it's getting us talking about the Bible. I mean, you know, we used to think that the Bible movies from the 60s and the 50s were inaccurate. I mean, good night. These, these movies that they're coming out with now, and I know they come out with Jesus movies, and they come out with, uh, you know, the Noah movie. What's the other one that they came out with? They, they came out with the Egyptian movie about Moses. I didn't really read up on it gods and kings or something, you know, I don't know, some worldly person want to tell us about it? No, I'm just kidding. But anyway, <laughs> but anyway, you know, the gods and kings or whatever, you know, who, I, I dread to think what they did to it. But they come out with these so-called biblical movies where they twist, what's the other one? Didn't they just come out with some other Bible movie recently? What is it? Help me out, people. Huh? Risen? No, oh, I didn't even hear it. I missed that one. I didn't. Young Messiah? Wasn't there, there was some other Old Testament story that they did recently, I thought. Maybe I'm just imagining things. Maybe I just had a bad dream or something. Exodus, Gods and Kings. Yeah, I mentioned that one. The Case for Christ. I, I'm not, not familiar with that one either. No, no, no. I'm talking about where they take the Bible stories and turn it into a Hollywood movie and change everything. You know, they got Noah being a psychopathic murderer of his own family and everything. Esther? You're just making stuff up now. And <laughs> hey, maybe it's in the works. I don't know. But my point is, they, they put out this dung and, and people just, they just embrace it. They just embrace the dung hill of whatever worldly Hollywood left behind. Did I mention that yet? That's the one I was missing. Left behind. You know, both versions of it, right? They put out left behind. The Christians get so excited. Oh, Nicolas Cage. Nicolas Cage's career is all washed up, apparently. He doesn't even believe in the Bible. He doesn't even believe in the rapture. He doesn't even believe in Christ. His career is, is, is hurting. 
So he figures he'll make a little money off the Christians for a while with the Left Behind film. But there are all kinds of just strange doctrines and, and weird teachings and just, just all kinds of, of garbage out there. And Christians today, when they haven't been listening to the word of God, they just embrace it. They just eat it up. And we that are, that are you know, reading God's word and, and listening to real preaching, you know, we're still used to eating the, the, the good food, the good things in life. We're still used to eating the, the, the surf and turf of God's word being faithfully preached. <laughs> and we look, we, we, we just, we can't even understand it. I mean, my mind is just blown when I see all the tens of thousands of people flocking to Benny Hinn. You know, just flocking to Kenneth Copeland, flocking to T.D. Jakes, flocking to these false teachers, and they just eat it up and they love it. And, and, and they don't understand us and we don't understand them. Right? We don't, I'm looking at them like, what are you, what? And they're looking at us like, what are you guys doing over the faithful word? But this is the same thing. It's like if you take somebody who's eaten junk food their whole life, if you took them to a fancy restaurant, they won't even like it. It's true. I mean, you could, if you take somebody who eats nothing but fast food and junk food, try taking them out to a fancy restaurant sometime, and they'll turn their nose up at everything. They don't understand it. They don't want, they're just like, give me a cheeseburger, you know. What is this stuff? Snails? You know, or what is, you know, what is, look, I, you know, if you could take, what's a really fancy restaurant? That, uh, that Hawaiian place. What's it called? Roy's. Who's been to that place? Oh, let's see, they're real high rollers here. Did you eat it in Hawaii? Yeah. Dude, was that place crazy or what? It was, it was really good. But was it expensive or what? Yeah. <laughs> That's the most expensive restaurant I've ever eaten at. I was doing it on a gift card, folks. All right? I'm not, a, I'm not some high roller pastor now, okay? Don't worry about me that I've gone over to the dark side as some, you know, oh, oh by the way, you know, Faith Ward's getting a private jet next week, you know. You know, I don't want you to get the wrong idea. I was doing it on a gift card. I was given a gift card. I got a gift card, and the gift card was like $150. But that's what it takes for two people to eat there. So my wife and I, we, w we got the gift card. We're like, well, are we going to go a couple times or, you know, bring the whole thing? <laughs> we went there. We went there, the two of us, and there's a dollar and 50 cents left on that gift card after one meal. I don't even think we got dessert. Or we, we split one. Yeah. But we have, a, we have like a buck 50 left. But I'm thinking like, man, I got this buck 50 left. I don't think I can afford to go spend this buck 50, though. There's nothing on the menu for a buck fifty. They might say hi to you for a buck fifty. But man, it was good. It was amazing. I mean, that food was awesome. We loved it. It was a great treat. We enjoyed it. It was a special, special outing. But you know what, though? There's a lot of people that even if you took them to Roy's Hawaiian Fusion, they'd walk away saying, drive me through McDonald's. I'm not kidding. You know that's true. Because their taste buds are so messed up from all the junk food. And that, that's today what we have. When we see Christians today embracing dung, literal dung for doctrine, that tells us there must be a famine of hearing God's word. Yeah. These people don't know what good food is. Right. They don't know what good meat is. Are you still there in Lamentations? Go to verse 6. For the punishment of the iniquity of the daughter of my people is greater than the punishment of the sin of Sodom that was overthrown as in a moment and no hand stayed on her. Her Nazarites were purer than snow. They were whiter than milk. They were more ruddy in body than rubies. Their polishing was of sapphire. I know that's a tough word, so let me help you. Lapis lazuli. Okay, verse 8. Their visage is blacker than a coal. They're not known in the streets. Nobody can even recognize them. Their skin cleaveth to their bones. It's withered. It has become like a stick. I mean, that's skinny. Yeah. <laughs> so the Bible's talking about the effects of starvation here. Their skin is cleaving to their bones. Withered. They look like a stick. Skin and bone. Blackened as coal. Not known. Not recognized in the streets. Verse 9, they that be slain with the sword are better than they that be slain with hunger. For these pine away, stricken through for want of the fruits of the field. 
The hands of the pitiful women have sodden their own children. Sodden means boiled. They were their meat in the destruction of the daughter of my people. Now this is, this is just, that's just the coup de grace right there, isn't it? And you know what I think we can learn from this spiritually? Is that when people are in a spiritual famine of hearing God's word, right? You know what happens? They don't love their children like they should. They, I mean, look, these people, what did it say back in verse number three of this same chapter? It says, or I'm sorry, yeah, yeah, in verse three. It says that they're hardened against their own young ones, right? Or, or, or am, I, am I mixing something from the book of Job? What's that? Yeah, they become cruel like the ostriches in the wilderness. But then if we were to cross-reference it over to Job like I normally would, we don't have time. But over in Job, it talks about how the ostrich, because they're compared to the ostrich here, the ostrich is hardened against her young ones is the word I was looking for. Okay, that's what the ostrich is like according to the book of Job. So they're hardened against their young ones. I mean, look, when you're sodding your young ones and that they're your meat, that's, you're hardened at that. I mean, that's, that's hard. That's a person who has lost all care and all normal affection for their child. And we see today people having an, a, a lack of natural affection for their children, not loving and caring about their children, not putting their children's welfare as a thing of importance in their life. It's like they don't care what happens to their children. They're so self-absorbed and just so uh, selfish and, and self-centered. They'll go to some, some liberal church they don't even care that their children aren't even learning the Word of God that they learned when they were young. But they don't even care that their children go to the devil. It doesn't even matter. Lack of love and affection for their children as a result of famine of, God's, of hearing God's Word. Verse number 11, the Lord hath accomplished His fury. He poured out His fierce anger and hath kindled a fire in Zion and hath devoured the foundations thereof. Verse 12, the kings of the earth and all the inhabitants of the world would not have believed that the adversary and the enemy should have entered into the gates of Jerusalem. Now, let me stop on this verse here. Verse 12, the kings of the earth and all the inhabitants of the world would not have believed that the adversary and the enemy should have entered into the gates of Jerusalem. Now, let me ask you this. If we were to go back in time to a period where there was not a famine of God's word being preached like it is now, if we were to go back in time, let me ask you this. Would the inhabitants of the world even have believed that we would just invite the enemies of Christ, the enemies of God into the house of God, into the church of God? Would the world, I'm not talking about the Christians, would the world even have believed in, for example, the 1950s or 60s, would they have believed that the adversary and the enemy should have entered into the gates of our church? Let me just put it to you this way. Would the world have believed in the 50s and 60s that we were bringing the Sodomites into the church in 2017 and embracing that dunghill? No one would have believed that. Look, my dad was born in the year 1950, and he grew up in Los Angeles, California. Just so you know, that's not the Bible Belt. He grew up in the San Fernando Valley, just right in the shadow of Hollywood, in the 1950s, he went to school. It was open in prayer. They read the Bible. And the, the men had to have short hair. And the girls had to wear skirts and dresses that went to the knee. This is in L.A. in the 60s. I mean, I'm talking about when he was 16, 17 in L.A. in the 60s. And every single school year, the public school would cancel school for one week and they call it the spiritual release or spiritual emphasis week or whatever they called it. And whatever religion you were, you'd go to your church for that week and have like a vacation Bible school with your church. And everybody was required to go to whatever their religion was. So if you were a Baptist, you know, you'd go to Faith Baptist Church on, on Farallone and Satakoy in Canoga Park, California. Or if you were the Catholic, you'd go over to St. Thomas the worker or whatever that Catholic, Saint somebody the worker. 
church, and my, you know, we were just talking about this the other day, but they'd go to a Catholic church, and if you were Methodist, you'd go to your Methodist church. So basically, it was just the school system even emphasizing spiritual things and, and telling people, hey, go to church for that. We're going to cancel instruction in a public school in California. We're canceling instruction for every student that they might focus on the things of God for one week, that they might just spend the whole day hearing God's word. Amen. Okay, we've come a long way, haven't we, in the last 50 years in America? But I wonder if at that time we would have even gone to just the worldly people of, of, of L.A., people that weren't even Christian, that said, hey, do you believe that 50 years from now churches will be bringing homosexuals into the church, inviting them into the church, just inviting the enemies of God, the hater? And look, the Bible says they're haters of God, folks. Yeah, it says in Romans 1, they hate God. They are haters of God. Would you have thought that they'd be bringing them into the church, embracing them into fellowship, embracing them into God's? You never would have even believed that. But today, for me even saying that, I'm considered radical and crazy and, you know, all this stuff. Look, I'm not preaching anything that would have sounded out of place before there was a famine of hearing God's word in this country. And because there's a famine of hearing God's word in this country, somebody actually pulls out the word of God and start preaching what it really says about the Sodomites. And people are, ah, oh, I've never heard that before. You know what it reminds me of? It's like when you give someone a new food that they've, well, I've never seen that before. I've never tried that. You know, some people just, they won't try anything new. Well, I, you know, give me something I'm familiar with. Give me chicken fingers, amen? You know. <laughs> That's, what you, you know, if somebody doesn't like chicken fingers, you're in trouble. Because that's usually a go-to if somebody's picky, chicken fingers and fries. I mean, it's just, you can't go wrong. But this attitude that says, well, I've never, you know, oh, I can't believe it. Well, it's not my fault that there's a famine of hearing God's word. You know, I, we, we've opened up a spiritual cafeteria here, you know, and, and, and we're, we're, we're trying to just, shovel out as much food as we can. I mean, we're trying to move people through the line and we're just slopping the food onto their plate and stuff, you know, and then through the internet, I mean, we've just got all kinds of delivery trucks just bringing bags and bags. You know, we're going down to Guyana. We're going to Malawi. We're going all over America. We're going to these soul winning marathons and we're just bringing suitcases and suitcases full of delicacies for people to get some good food, to get some spiritual meat on the bones. And then, literally, over the issue of the sodomites, of all things, people are just like, oh, I've never tasted anything like this before. It's Roy's Fusion. <laughs> Do you know how much that costs? Yeah. Oh, I, I don't know what this is. I want a happy meal. I want a happy sermon. I want a toy in it. Where's the toy? Grow up. Now, did they give you a toy at Roy's? I didn't get a toy either. There's no toy handed out at Roy's Hawaiian Fusion. Was there, did they have a playland in the back with a slide? Yeah I, didn't, yeah, I didn't see it either. You know, I mean, look, the enemy, the adversary, entering into the gates of Jerusalem. When the Bible says in 2 Kings 23, 7, that the righteous king Asa break down the houses of the Sodomites that were by the house of the Lord. So the house of the Sodomites were by the house of the Lord. King Asa said, break them down. And you know what? He did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, it said. But today, it's not enough to have them by the house of the Lord. They want them in the house of the Lord. We got to bring these people in. Otherwise, how are they going to get saved? They're reprobates, number one. But number two, even if you believe they can get saved, then you go out and get them all saved, for all I care. Go out and get them saved. Did you know that people don't have to come to church to be saved? We're not bringing in these dangerous predators and dangerous pedophiles. We're not bringing in the enemy and the adversary and the hate. Look, there's nobody who hates God more than these sodomites. Just ask them. They'll tell you. They hate the Lord. But they'll pretend, 
Oh, yeah, I just want to worship with you. No, it's they're infiltrating, folks. Yeah. They're trying, it's a Trojan horse trying to get into the gates of Jerusalem here. Well, not this Jerusalem, but they say, oh, you know, we got to bring them in. That's a dunghill of a doctrine. And right here we see that even the world would have never thought that was possible. They would have said, that'll never happen. You're a fool if you think that'll happen. If we would have said that in the 50s, hey, preachers, I mean, I wish I could get in a time machine, right? Go back in time to the 50s and 60s and take these guys aside and say, listen, guys, you need to preach a little harder on the sodomites because you, you guys don't know what's coming. <laughs> so you need to really lay a strong foundation with your church members so that they know so they don't buy into this. They would have said, what are you, that'll never happen. I don't want to talk about that subject. It's too unwholesome. Why well, keep preaching on that? No, really, it's going to be everywhere. No, it won't. No, Baptists will be bringing them in. No, that you're crazy. They never would have believed it. Isn't that what it says here? Yes. But yet, it happened. Because of what? Because of the famine. Because of the famine of God's word. Look at verse 13. For the sins of her prophets and the iniquities of her priests that have shed the blood of the just in the midst of her. They've wandered as blind men in the streets. They've polluted themselves with blood. Now, I got to hurry for sake of time here. I'm going to skip some of this. You know, I, we could expound all this. You can read it on your own and, and let the Holy Spirit guide you through some of this. But for sake of time, let's jump down to verse 20, just for sake of time. The breath of our nostrils, the anointed of the Lord, was taken in their pits, of whom we said, under his shadow we shall live among the heathen. Now that's kind of a tough verse there. It's kind of a, a, a mouthful. Let's break this down. The breath of our nostrils... The anointed of the Lord was taken in their pits of whom we said, under his shadow we shall live among the heathen. Okay, let's break this down. First, let's start at the end and work backwards here. Under his shadow we shall live among the heathen. Now, this is talking about the Jews, right? The context of the book is the children of Judah, they're experiencing famine because of the destruction of Jerusalem, because of the Babylonian army, coming in and invading them, and they're going to go captive into all nations of the world. They're saying, under his shadow, we shall live among the heathen. The his there is talking about the, he the, the heathen people. They're saying, we're going to live under their shadow as we live among them. Okay, there are bad people under whose shadow they think they're going to live among the heathen. Let me prove that to you. Back up a little bit. It says, was taken in their pits of whom we said, under his shadow we shall live among the heathen. So somebody has a pit for them. Now what is a pit? A pit is a trap to catch someone, right? It's a snare. You don't want to fall into a pit, do you? If somebody digs a pit for you, they're out to get you. They're out to hurt you. They're out to destroy you, right? So the people, made, these bad people, made a pit, and God's people, the anointed of the Lord, the anointed of the Lord, meaning God's people, were taken in those pits, their pits of whom we said, under his shadow we shall live among the heathen. I know that's kind of a tough verse. But what's he saying there? He's saying they thought that they could basically live among the world and get under the world's shadow and live under the world's shadow, the heathen shadow, the shadow of the wicked, and that it's going to be great, but actually is a trap. Those people under whose shadow they began to trust were actually digging a pit for them, actually out to get them, out to destroy them, out to insert them. Does everybody understand? It's kind of a tough verse, but when you slow down and break it down, it makes sense at that point. Now, all throughout the Bible... God uses the shadow as a reference to trusting in him. Trusting in him, getting under God's shadow, right? Letting him cover us. The Bible says, and I'll just read these quickly, keep me as the apple of the eye, hide me under the shadow of thy wings, the shadow of God's wings. How excellent is thy loving kindness, O God. Therefore, the children of man put their trust under the shadow of thy wings. Psalm 36, 7. Because thou hast been my help, Therefore, in the shadow of thy wings will I rejoice. 
Psalm 63, 7. And Psalm 91, 1 says, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. So when we're trusting in the Lord, when we have all of our faith in God, we're under his shadow. He's a shade unto us to protect us from the sun by day, you know, as it says in Psalm 121 and so forth. So they're trying to get among the heathen and under the world's shadow, under the shadow of the wicked. And we need to get under, the God, under God's shadow is what the Bible's saying. You know, we need to trust in the Lord. And these are basically people who want to get worldly. They want to ride on the coattails, not of the Lord, not of Jesus, not of the apostles. They want to ride on the world's coattails. They want to use the world's methodology. They want to use the world's music. They want to use the world's celebrities, right? And that's what they put their trust in and under whose shadow they want to be. And it's a trap. It's a pit that you fall into is what the Bible's saying here. So when there's a famine of God's word, instead of trusting in the Lord, trusting in his word, we start to lean on worldly gimmicks, mm -hmm. cheap entertainment, worldly methods of building the church, worldly music, worldly program. Because, hey, we live among the heathen. We got to be like them to win them. But it's a pit. Yep. And I'll close with this. The Bible says, in verse 21, rejoice and be glad, O daughter of Edom that dwellest in the land of Uz. The cup also shall pass through unto thee. Thou shalt be drunken and shalt make thyself naked. So we see here that as a result of a famine of God's word, God's people, and here it's the Edomites, but that's because they're going through the same type of famine. It's coming to them next. God's saying, hey, look, Edom, don't get too excited. It's coming to you next drunkenness and nudity, right? That's what happens when there's a famine of God's word. And that's what we see today in America too. A lot of drunkenness, a lot of nudity, a lot of promiscuity, a lot of wickedness. The punishment of thine iniquity is accomplished, O daughter of Zion. He will no more carry thee away into captivity. He will visit thine iniquity, O daughter of Edom. He will discover thy sin. So, a famine of hearing God's word. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. And they shall wander from sea to sea, and from the north even to the east, they shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord and shall not find it. But Matthew 13, 16 says this, but blessed are your eyes for they see, and your ears for they hear. For verily I say unto you that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see those things which ye see and have not seen them, and to hear those things which ye hear and have not heard them. What the Bible is saying is, look, if you are hearing God's word today, if you have the Bible, King James Bible, you read it, you study it, you go to a church where it's being faithfully preached, whether that's our church or those that are visiting, you go to a church back home where the word of God's being preached and you're being fed, you know, realize that that's a blessing. Realize that's a pro. Realize that there are other people in this world that are hungry for that and they're not getting it. We ought to not take it for granted, not take it lightly, and we need to realize we need to stay in church. Amen. Stay under the preaching of God's word because if we don't, if we start to fast from God's word, fast from hearing God's word, you know what's going to eventually start to happen is we're going to go down this road of embracing dung hills. We're going to go down this road of of not loving our children like we should, not loving our wife like we should. We're going to go down this road of sin and lasciviousness, and we're going to become a vessel of dishonor that God can't use. We better make sure that we have a steady diet of nutritious food going into our bodies, and we better make sure that we have a steady diet of God's word coming into our ears. Whether that's listening to an audio Bible being read to us, Alexander Scurby or Dominique Davis or somebody, you know, audio Bible coming in, or whether that's listening to Bible preaching, coming to church, get your kids under this preaching. They're hungry for it. Amen. They're hungry for the word. Read them the Bible at night before bed. They're hungry for it at that age. They haven't been corrupted. They haven't gotten backslidden and disillusioned. They don't have the malice and, and envy that a lot of people develop later in life. 
Get your family and yourself under God's word. Listen to it, hear it, and embrace that so you don't embrace a dunghill. Let's bow.